and the failure or the, the lack of opportunity to develop a leadership which had that issue of, of, of <coughs> meshing national liberation with social and economic change. <coughs> that Mello stands out from that period of time, in some ways just because of so few. Uh, and the fact that that, that time had been from recovery to 1916, that you didn't have a period of time to recover or to create a leadership arising out of the war of independence because of the shortage, the, 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 the shortage of the time, uh, but also the fact that we're coming out of the First World War, which had, had created havoc across Europe. I'd call it all types of dissension within Ireland itself. Uh, and so he stands out as a leader in some ways because there were so few other leaders on the social and the economic front. But for all of that, for all of that, the epitomise is maybe rather because of the shortage of the right, the epitomise is something that could have happened if there had been sufficient time and if your social leadership, like Conley and those people, had not been executed in 16. So, he came to the fore at a time where there was an absence of political thinking. There was military thinking, but the, <coughs> time, the space within that struggle to develop a political leadership. And so it was very easy for the conservative right of what's termed the Gandhi to actually control uh, and, and indeed support partition <coughs> because it supported their interests. You know? So I, I think. When he left it out of the question that when he prompted an application, it's just a pity that there were not more uh, a more evolved social leadership able to come to the fore around that time. Thanks, Joe. <coughs> Anybody else? <coughs> Sorry, sir. Me? Yeah, it's Jenny Handel. Yeah, look on that one. <laughs> more I just want to ask, do you think Meadows will be happy with the situation with the party as it's in his present day? Thank you. Yes. Me? Yes. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, how are you all? <laughs> yeah, for me, you can stand down and not get it. <laughs> we get on very well. Both, uh, both candidates came. But uh, I was at, at, at a, you, you mentioned, sorry, going back to Common Turn and uh, the leadership of the Communist Party, but communists, well, in, in the Communist Party since the 19, uh, 60, what was it, 67, 68, so around, around that time. And uh, I've always seen, seen that, that, that the Republicans, Republicanism and Socialism, to go hand in hand. And most of the leadership actually of the, of the Communist Party would have been Republicans. But they didn't drop the Republicans. But I was recent, about two, year, two or three years ago, I was at a meeting in the uh, Sinn Féin had a, a, he had invited over, was it Yaris? Arafakis, yeah. yeah. <coughs> and the Shelburne it was. Pardon? The Shelburne Hotel. Shelburne, was, exactly, yeah. yeah. And listening to that, um, well, after, uh, and after the meeting, I was very convinced that Sinn Féin was now moving towards social democracy and perhaps away from republicanism. And uh, listen to yourself on two this morning, you said we were compromised because we made in that. But it was like listening to when the Labour Party was on, they had made compromises, then became more compromises and more. And that's the danger. Okay, so first of all on Paul's question, um, the first thing is there, there is nothing stopping the Irish government from having a massive public housing building programme, nothing whatsoever. They could do it tomorrow if they wanted. They could do it within the existing, uh, uh, what they call, fiscal space uh, that they've agreed with the European Union about the spending and, and borrowing rules. Or, for example, they could uh, uh, increase discretionary taxation, as Sinn Féin has proposed, and that would give them even greater increased spending possibilities. So. It, it's, it's one of the things that 
Finna Fáil and Fine Gael do quite often, which is they blame the European Union for preventing them from doing things they don't want to do themselves, so they don't take the blame for it. So, could you have a house building program of 10,000 public housing units a year, every year from now? Yes. And actually, the money is there to do it. If you wanted to move it from 10,000 units a year, and keep in mind, never in the history of the state has the state provided 10,000 new public houses a year uh, for such a long period of time. But if you want to do more than that, the European Union's rules are very clear. <clears throat> All you have to do is raise additional discretionary taxation, and you can spend that additional discretionary spend. And, and interestingly, in fact, the, and this isn't me being, being soft on the European Union, because I'll come to that in a second. The European Commission, in their uh, latest, although we haven't got the full copy, but bits of it have been leaked, their latest post bailout report, are hugely critical of the Irish government for underinvesting in, in, in capital infrastructure. Uh, it's one of the big weaknesses uh, of, of the current government. Having said all of that, you are right, the uh, fiscal treaty, as it's called, or the austerity treaty, as we call it, and some of the associated regulations, are an attempt to place uh, spending limits uh, on uh, governments. And they do that in a way that kind of says, because they know most mainstream centre-right or centre-left governments don't want to increase overall taxation, and therefore they're saying, well, if you don't increase taxation, you can't spend more because they want to restrict borrow. So there is a really strong case to be made to change those uh, fiscal rules. Obviously, we argued against them both in Brussels and Strasbourg when they were coming through as regulations, and we argued and campaigned against them in terms of the treaty. And David Cullinan and Pierce Doherty are currently looking at doing a piece of work to say, first of all, is there a greater flexibility within the rules currently, which the government isn't telling us about, which there is, and we'd like people to know that. But two, if we were to change those rules, how would we change them? So, I think you're wrong on the housing bit, but I think you're actually right on the core point, which is the rules, and they absolutely do need to change. And in some senses, it's like a lot of things that the European Union does. It says that it's not trying to limit government spending, and at a very superficial level, it's like, yeah, that's true, you can raise extra taxes. Very clearly, what they're trying to do is, is limit the ability of, of the old social democratic state to borrow and spend, particularly at times of, of economic crisis. Um, uh, in favour of the kind of austerity and the policies that they've, they've put in place. Uh, but you should keep an eye out for the, the work David and, and Pierce are doing because that's going to be very interesting. I, I think Joe's point is right. Um, and one of the things that always strikes me is it took the anti treaty side a decade to understand the change that had happened after the treaty. Uh, it just, you know, they were so uh, disorientated, uh, which of course is hard surprising given imprisonment, execution, uh, political loss, etc. But what's also very important is, is the first section of the anti-treaty movement that understood and responded to that change climate were the people who then became Fianna Fáil. And one of the things they did brilliantly, and this isn't a, 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 an expression of sympathy with Fianna Fáil, but it's just a recognition of one of the things they did in a very smart way, is they understood the need to co-opt those sections of, of society that, if they hadn't been co-opted, would have been the social constituency for Labour or for left Republicans or and that kind of quasi-social democratic space that people like Sean Lamas represented. So by investing in social housing provision, for example, or by investing in certain social uh, welfare payments, Fianna Fáil kind of built this cross-class alliance. Um, uh, ultimately, of course, it came apart, but they were the first to get that. Uh, and I think that then further confused the left Republicans in the IRA and, and uh, in the various uh, social movements outside. And it took them until Clan the Publica to work out what their place was. And actually, interestingly enough, with Clan the Publica, the scale of the challenge that they then represented to Fianna Fáil was enormous. The difficulty was, and this relates to the last question, is that in some senses, Clan could have prevented Fianna Fáil from becoming the dominant force that they went on to become for the entire 20th century from that point on. But by going into coalition, in the all-party coalition, as early as they did, then very quickly, the party undermined themselves and ended up uh, dissolving in internal disputes and, and policy compromises. Uh, but I just think it's, it's, it's not just that the leaders were executed or lost, it's that our ancestors during that period couldn't get to grips with the changes that were taking place around them quick enough. Uh, and by the time they did, others uh, had moved on, both Fine Gael in the formation and, and Fianna Fáil, and uh, I think that's a kind of an important lesson from history. Would Mel be happy? I have no idea. Um, and I always think it's the wrong question to ask. Like, we don't know if, if people who are deceased would or wouldn't support this or that thing in, in, in the present. Um, I think it's much more valuable for us because I think one of the things we often do is 
is we look back to our history to find justifications for things we think we're doing right today. I always think we're much better looking back to history to find out the things that didn't go right, to learn the lessons of those mistakes so we don't repeat those mistakes. So rather than asking, you know, would Mellows approve or not approve, which nobody can answer, and I suppose that's why the comments I made were the kinds that they were, which is, <coughs> Mellows didn't succeed. That's not a, a criticism or to dismiss him, or it's just a fact of history. And I think at every generation where our predecessors didn't succeed, we need to understand why, so that we can be much better in, in the present to, to kind of deal with the issues that Joe uh, raised. And then on the last point, don't get me wrong, my argument wasn't that we should be making those compromises, but they are questions and issues which we're always debating. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think this is the big challenge. So, on the one hand, Sinn Féin wants to be in government. I want Sinn Féin to be in government. Because I want, for example, to have a Sinn Féin Minister for Housing building 10,000 public houses a year. I want a Sinn Féin Minister for Health who's investing the 10 billion euros or so over whatever period of time to build a transnational health service. You know, I want a Sinn Féin uh, Minister uh, for Irish Unity uh, who's developing that comprehensive white paper or green paper or whatever it is uh, on all aspects of unification so that when we have the referendum, we have the arguments and the information uh, to equip ourselves to win those things. So, that's what I want. The difficulty is, we're what, 13%? We're a pretty small group of people, in real terms. And even if we have a good election the next time around and we get to where the polls currently tell us that, 18, 90, 90%. <coughs> so that means you have a choice. Do you say, we're never going to go into government until we have an overall majority, ourselves, on our own? Well, that means we're never going to go into government. Do we then say, okay, well we want to go into government and we want to build alliances with other progressive forces and people on the left and people who share our ideas, Okay, and that's the option that people like me have been arguing for a long time. But when you add all of those people up, we're still a very small group of people. We don't always get on very well. Sometimes we're tearing lumps out of each other, as you've seen this week. Um, and we haven't managed to convince the electorate that we have a better proposition than others. And therefore, if that's not going to work, or that's not going to work for the next 5, 10, or 15 years, then you have to at least debate the option uh, of, of uh, coalition uh, with forces which don't share your ideological program and there are huge risks in that uh, and one of the things I think we need to be debating more is <coughs> those occasions when not just in Ireland but in other European countries progressive or left of centre or radical republicans went into coalition governments and there's been quite a lot of them sometimes as junior partners sometimes as co-equal partners sometimes as in the case of Greece as a majority partner and yet in all of those instances maybe with one or two exceptions they failed in their particular projects so none of these choices are, are straightforward. None of them offer easy solutions. I still think we have to debate them, but I would share your concern, um, as would Yanis um, at this point in time, having been inside the Greek government, uh, that he felt that one of the reasons he left uh, had less to do with the uh, attitude of the Troika, and he just didn't believe that Tsipras was going to make the kinds of decisions that he felt were appropriate to respond to the, 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 the diktats on uh, EU leaders, including this country. Um, the issue then is, if we say, okay, we're not going to do that, then what's our route into government? What's our route into having those ministers in those positions to make those kinds of changes? Um, and I think that's a debate we urgently need to have. Thank you, Owen. Okay. I'm going to let Patrick first. Okay. Thank you, sir. Patrick. Ruby, I'm going to be You look just be better for being kind to me that second this morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, um, thanks very much for the talk, very interesting. I suppose one of the, the, the key issues that you touch on is how broad does our front need to be to achieve our goals uh, to a certain extent. And it's often a discussion that Jerry brings about that we need to you know, achieve a broad alliance, a broad front to achieve our goals. And if you look back, to, I suppose, to 1916 and to 1919, in a way, it was quite a, it was a very, very broad uh, group of Republicans, ranging from Conservative right to, uh, I suppose, uh, radical left. Um, and that's one of the questions there. How broad does it need to be, in your view? With regards to Noel, I suppose there's, that there is that tension between purity and then ability to implement, uh, which is obviously a very difficult tension that's always been in existence. I think the difference between Sinn Fein and the Labour Party is um, there isn't careerism typically in Sinn Fein. And in the Labour Party, there has been uh, careerism there. So the, re the reaction to working against in the north of Ireland, for example, <coughs> pulling the plug when uh, corruption didn't allow for uh, 
uh, decent uh, governance in that space was typically very different than a careerist would make on this side of the border uh, as well. You, you missed about the progressive alliances that are necessary. I think you're right, and I think the, the right to water, to a certain extent, has been a high mark with regards and um, decent uh, progressive alliances um, uh, in this side of the, uh, of the country. However, it does seem to me maybe that um, since that, you know, trying to build on that is like kind of minding mice at crossroads as well. That's very difficult because there's a number of like inter left competition is a major challenge uh, rather than uh, interleft uh, cooperation which it, it should be um, and then like trying to work with labour and the unions with regard to a project how difficult will it be to, um, to build that progressive alliance and where do you see it vis-a-vis -vis the high water mark of the right to water campaign a few years ago? Thank you Paddy oh, Thanks very much, very interesting Two medals, and you were asking the question or, or posing the question there, what would uh, medals think of certain things? Maybe it might be better question to say, what would we think, or what would you, and maybe Pada might be able to throw some some ask some light in the question. Would medals be a member of Sinn Fein today, or would he be allowed to be a member of Sinn Fein? Um, when I think of medals, I think of um, <coughs> I think of two words: radicalism and socialism. And it's, in my view, it's no coincidence that he was one of the earliest uh, members to be executed because he, he solved two issues in that regard. He was anti the treaty and he was socialist. And you have to remember back at the time, we were basically a very conservative country back at that stage. It was only after the war that people started realizing that, you know, this conservatism has to change and there has to be a redistribution of wealth and assets, um, not only within Ireland but within Europe and I suppose the world generally. But I'm just curious to know would Meadows be, where would he be today? <coughs> would he be in Champaign or would he be maybe more to the left of current Champaign? Thank you. Caroline, you want to thank See, I think part of the, the answer to that question, whenever we have these debates, we have a tendency just to talk about the history of Ireland. So we talk about what's happened with the Labour Party in the past or whatever. And I think we need to, first of all, broaden our horizons and just look at the countries around us over the last two or three decades. Because in all of these countries, there are parties just like us, or there are social movements just like us, who have been struggling with exactly the same issues. And some of them have got to much more advanced stages than we have, uh, and they have a wealth of experience. And again, Greece is, is a good starting point, because... If you take Greece, so what you had was you know, a relatively small left-wing left space between the different parties. 
then over a very short period of time because of circumstances and, and decisions and activism, two things grew enormously. One, Syriza grew as a political party to such an extent that it was able to, to lead almost a majority government. But at the same time, and connected to it but independent of it, you had this huge progressive social movement emerge on the streets with young people, with trade unions, that was supportive of, of, of the party, but not of the party. They were supportive of it so long as it was going to do the things that they wanted it to do. Um, so, first of all, there's a whole wealth of experience to learn about, well, how does that happen and how do you do that and how do you build those alliances and, and keep in mind, series of themselves are a coalition uh, and then part of a much bigger social movement. But then they get into government and then they are confronted with a whole series of obstacles, domestic, European and international. And then they make a whole series of decisions, good, bad, and, and uh, 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 terrible, depending on, on your particular points of view. And my point isn't to kind of say they did or didn't do the right thing, I have very strong views on that, but we don't talk about that enough. <coughs> and one of the things that really frustrates me is all the Irish left were talking about Syriza when they were on the way up, but very, very few people are seriously talking about writing, about thinking about what went wrong. And there's been, I think, three books, one by Helena Sheehan and two books by, um, by, by non-Irish writers, three, three books by non-Irish writers that have tried to track it, but I don't think any of them have come up with really comprehensive answers other than, you know, individuals made bad decisions. Yes, individuals made bad decisions, but that in and of itself doesn't explain. Likewise, for example, in Italy, France, in Cyprus, uh, in Norway, in Sweden, in Iceland, since the 1980s, there have been left-wing governments with very, very radical left-wing programs uh, in positions of power. Uh, and we don't talk enough about how did they get there, what difficulties did they confront, what bad decisions did they make, did they have alternatives. And I think, because, you know, whether people agree with it or not, Sinn Féin, uh, in terms of our current position, is, is trying to chart out a route into government. We need to be discussing all of that and learning all of those lessons. I don't have the answers to those things, but I'm somebody who's avidly trying to, to learn why this stuff didn't work in other countries. And I think that's part of the answer. The other issue is, and it's a superficial comparison, but it's always much easier to have unity when you're opposing something. You know, so the independence movement, you're right, it was this huge plural movement, right? Um, at times in huge disagreement with itself, but it had a central point of opposition, which was the British occupation. Um, right to water, again, lots and lots of disagreements, Big, big strategic and, and organisational questions and battles have been fought out internally, but we were opposed to a single thing. The lesson, of course, is then when you look at right to change, it becomes much more tricky when you're then trying to take that energy and that uh, mass mobilisation that was opposed to the water charges and turn it into a positive movement, even for some basic principles for uh, uh, social and economic transformation. Um, and I think they probably did as good a job uh, as they could uh, at that point. But then it just disappeared after the election. The trade unions had to get back into representing workers in the middle of a whole series of industrial disputes. We were all elected into the Dáil and we're dealing with legislation and party building and, and all of that stuff. So, first of all is how do we all carve out a little bit of space to get back to that discussion, that dialogue? And then around what are you doing? You know, so, uh, again, it's much easier when you have a single point to focus on. Um, and I don't think any of us are doing it. I don't think the unions are really doing it at the minute because they're so busy with everything else. We're not doing it. The other political pillar partners of, of Right to Change aren't doing it. So the first thing is we at least have to start. And for me, one of the interesting examples is Norway. Norway, as most people know, uh, was a country with traditionally very, very strong centre-left governments. Strong universal public services, uh, very good quality of life, uh, and very good progressive international policies. But like a lot of social democratic countries in the late 80s and early 90s, they moved increasingly away from that. More privatisations and less universal public services, etc. Uh, and as a consequence of that, the Social Democratic Party, the, the, the main uh, party of the centre-left, diminished, diminished in size. So what happened was the unions came together, this is quite some time ago, really concerned with what was happening with the country and the general shift to the right. And they said, okay, two years out from the general election, they were going to launch what they called a long campaign. They were going to set out a bunch of policy principles in a whole range of areas. And through the union networks, through the environmental networks, inside the progressive political parties, the Social Democrats, the left and the left socialists and the Greens, promote the idea of a different kind of government. And they did that solidly for two years. That government was then elected, uh, uh, and it had probably the most left of centre program for government that I've seen of any European government in the last 30 years. And in the first term of office, they pretty much implemented 
large chunks of that. They then got elected for a second term and there were some very interesting things then. Um, uh, and as it often happens, of course, people get fed up with the incumbents and, and there was eventually a change. The irony of all of that was our sister party, the Left Socialist in, in Norway, who were a central part in that long campaign and who did very, very well in the election of the first period of government uh, three terms ago. When it came to the second general election, they were the big losers because a lot of social democratic voters thought, well, if we vote for the to a traditional social democratic party. Then when the second election came, people went back to the previous. So I, again, I think there are lessons in that in terms of how it worked. But the real thing is you have to be serious about it. You have to want that kind of unity, that, that kind of, uh, of high watermark as you, and then you have to put the resources and time and, and the energy uh, into it. In terms of, um, sorry, I don't know your name, but I, I would like Liam Mellis to be in Sinn Féin today if, if a person like him was, was, was alive, and I think we would <coughs> that somebody like him should be in. But again, I don't know if he would be or not. That's, that's a separate thing. But what I would say is, Ireland wasn't a conservative country at that point in our history. One of the things that I think we misunderstand is after the Civil War, during that period of, of the, the 1930s and, and early 40s, that's the period, that devotional revolution period, where we became a much, much more conservative country than we actually had been earlier. And like I spent a lot of last year re reading you know, a lot of the new histories around 1916, and in fact, there was a hell of a lot of radicalism and widespread public support in rural Ireland and urban Ireland for lots of ideas that only a decade later would become very, very unfashionable. So sometimes we kind of read, you know, because the devotional revolution and, and, and you know, that kind of Eucharistic Congress kind of period of, you know, very conservative Catholic, we then kind of assume that the two decades or three decades before that were the same. Actually, they were much more open, I, I think, in that case. And I, it's just something that's worth, worth uh, remembering. And then Caroline's question. Um, First of all, I'm not so sure we have such a big problem in terms of engaging with young people at one level, right? which is young people vote for us more than they vote for any other party. So clearly we're doing and saying something that is of interest to them. What we're very bad at, however, is going to the places where young people are and engaging with them on the issues that are important to them. Um, and then we complain that there's none of them in the room. Well, of course, why would, you, why would you bother in your late teens, early 20s, coming to a room like this and listen to some old fellow like me talk this kind of nonsense. Like, I wouldn't have come here when I was 18 or 19, uh, and I wouldn't blame any other 18 or 19 for not coming. At the same time, look at North. Look at the election there. We mobilised thousands of young people. Like, when we were going up in the cam canvases, like, we had some canvases in North Belfast, and like, 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds. Look at the Achna Gaelic movement. Look at the mobilisations around that. So, clearly, we know how to do it. Uh, I just think sometimes we forget the simple stuff, like, don't expect young people to come and do what we do. You know, we have to go to them, engage with them, identify the issues, and then empower them to kind of go and do that stuff themselves. And when you do that, and Ock Gaelic is a good example, I think that bears the, 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 the fruits of, of, of that activity. Um, so I think we need to do more of what we're already doing and do it more consistently around the country, and, and uh, I think we get better results. Thank you. Does anyone else want to come in? Yes, just, just a brief question. Um, I remember in 2007, when we were going around uh, canvassing the doors, um, we, uh, we, would, we would knock on doors and we'd ask people obviously to consider voting for Sinn Féin, we'd put forward the, the party platform. Uh, and then I remember distinctly people saying, well, it's either loan out there, the only way you can get the loan actually cut for us. Um, and then also that radically changed in 2011 because the, the, the massive crisis politically educated literally hundreds of thousands of people to realise that all of the structures within society knit together to affect your life directly. Um, and there's a danger to a certain extent over the next number of years, and uh, if job numbers increase and, and jobs fall and, and extra money comes into the coffers, and um, that that culture of 2007 could return to a certain extent. And to me, there's, there's an underlying idea behind it all, and that's the idea of individualism. And the whole idea that uh, in individualism, that you're basically only concerned for your own patch, your own four walls, and um, your own particular income. Uh, and we, we had Louise O'Reilly here last night, and she was talking about, even within the trade union movement, she was finding that much more uh, actions that were taken were on the basis of individuals wanting legal actions to, 
deal with their own particular legal issues within their working environment, rather than the inst John down the, the, the down the aisle and, and Joan down the aisle are, are getting stuffed, and I need to be standing with them to, to, to resolve that. And um, so sometimes you have ideas like individualism that spread throughout society and actually change the landscape in which <coughs> the political sphere actually works. And that can have nearly as a big effect on all your activities and, and your your policies and your growth than anything else. Um, and I would have a fear to a certain extent that uh, as the economy improves for some, and while it locks out many, you will have a return for uh, of that level of when you knock on the door maybe uh, in in 2020 uh, and ask people, you know, what do we need to do as a society to fix the the the, the elements <coughs> of society? The people will turn around. Well, actually, see the lawn out there. Can you get that cut? Or, you know what I mean? And just your views on that. I'm going to take another one too. Questions or comments? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Sorry, uh, can I just say when, when you talk about uh, someone mentioned about getting young people involved in uh, politics, I have four young teenagers, and they're all very political and progressive. And when you sit down today and read what's in the media, say there's 300,000 papers sold today, how many words in all of those papers do people sit down and read that actually talk about Sinn Fein? That's where the problem lies. Just um, when you look at trade unionism in Ireland, you look at the right to water campaign, and sometimes I suppose what the right wing political parties like to have a little box that a trade union fits into nice and neatly and just cares about paying conditions in this area, and we don't talk about social change and anything else. It was brilliant to see and involve himself, like going back to the traditions of Larkin in every aspect of a worker's life, not only his pay conditions outside of that. Now we feel there's a, a battle going on with trade unions or within trade unions at the moment. We have really good trade unions like Mandate, uh, like Unite, um, who are actually outside the box. And if you just even look at the two disputes that's in the national <laughs> papers at the moment, one is with Tesco and one is with uh, Bus Airman. If you look at mandates body language and what they've done they basically said look we're going to take on this multinational we're going to take on we're going to pull out all the stops we are out there and we're staying out until we get what the members are looking for now you look at the other stance which are trade unions in my mind controlled by the Labour Party and basically the allowed bus air and the government to dictate the agenda and the agenda now is only about cuts I think we should encourage the likes of the Brendan Ogles of this world, the likes of uh, the mandates of this world, and we need to criticise the likes of SIP2, who've actually allowed the agenda to be stolen for them. And bus workers now are only talking about cuts. In my mind, if Brendan Ogle was in charge of that dispute, it would be a completely different dispute. Because what you would be told is, this country will come to a standstill unless our members get a pay rise, which they haven't gotten eight years, and they're looking at more pay cuts now. So we need to encourage trade unions like Mandate and Unite and Brendan Ogle, who step outside the box in the tradition of James Connolly and Larkin into every aspect of a worker's life. And we need to put it up to the likes of Jack O'Connor, who actually was missing in action since 2008. 
and Patricia King and the likes of them. We need to put it up to them. And I'd ask Sinn Féin to put it up to them. To come on board, to look at the social issues outside just paying conditions. Because it affects us all, including young people. Um, I understand what Pat is saying, but, but uh, some people are improving. That I think there has been a change. Um, and I think part of that is because of the nature of that dispute. But part of it is also because of how uh, Mandate operates. Because Mandate don't just operate, um, and I know they're not the only union involved, but they don't just...